This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, August of 2015 may be young, but this show is not. Mm. Either are its anchors. Still going <laughs> strong after 49 years of the show, that is. You're watching the Georgia Farm Monitor. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Coming up on today's show, why the city of Chatsworth is getting a much needed addition in 2018, the many benefits it will provide, and the type of products that it's expected to move. We'll have that. Also on the show, no doubt you've seen them in fields across the country. Today we answer the question, why is high tunnel farming becoming more and more popular? Plus, we lift off and head to Spalding County to show you some of the unique and interesting research projects currently taking place at the UGA Griffin campus. These stories and much more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. After spending the past few years in Panama City, Florida, peanut producers from across the southeast gathered in Pine Mountain, Georgia recently for the 2015 Southern Peanut Growers Conference. Even though the location may have changed, it was once again a great opportunity for growers to network and hear from experts in the industry. Mark Wildman follows that story. Callaway Gardens provided the backdrop for the 2015 Southern Peanut Growers Conference. Producers from all over the Southeast gathered to hear from experts about many important topics that affect the peanut industry. It's a good time for farmers to come, get away from the farm, and understand a lot of new technology that's being developed, whether it's a whatever research, research area or whether it's in industry. And I'm also excited about peanuts from a standpoint that we don't have a lot of GMO, GMOs in peanuts and we're still at the land-grant colleges. We've got good researchers that's developing new seed. I'm also the seed that we have that uh, produces good yields, good quality peanuts, uh, resistant to diseases and all. We've got a lot of great things going on in peanuts. There were many key issues discussed at the conference and it is all an effort to keep producers informed and keep the industry growing. Farmers look forward to attending this event every year and feel the information they receive helps them on the farm. This morning alone we've been talking about genomics and uh, how they're going to help our peanuts, uh, to how, how they're going to help us to uh, develop new cultivars in a, in a faster way. Uh, and that's important. Uh, it takes uh, 12, 15 years to develop a cultivar now. Uh, and get it to where I can plant it in my field. And if we can shorten that down, uh, there's always some pest or some kind of problem that, that comes along and changes uh, what we need to do in the peanut industry. Uh, if we can shorten that down to getting a new product out there for us, that just makes things much better. Georgia Farm Bureau President Zippy Duval welcomed the group to Georgia. Even though he has never raised peanuts, he can understand the pride farmers feel about growing this famous Georgia crop. And I tell you, one of the loves I've gained since I ran for president nine years ago was to ride in South Georgia in late September, 1st October, and smell them peanuts that just been dug. Can they all relate to that? That is one of the most wonderful smells I have ever experienced. Now, all my years of farming, I didn't get to smell that. Another highlight from the conference for producers was hearing from Deputy Secretary of Agriculture Krista Hardin. Being raised in Camilla, Georgia, she understands how important peanuts are and how important it is to get the next generation involved in farming. Agriculture is the foundation of it all. There are more jobs in agriculture than we have people to fill. Why? Because we don't talk about how great it is. We talk about the margins. We talk about how tough it is. We talk about the negatives when it is so good. When it's so good. Go to a 4-H club. Go to an FFA club. Go to a girls and boys club. Go into this town. Go talk to kids about agriculture. Talk about that passion that you have and why you have it and the rewards you get for being involved in this wonderful industry about feeding people. As farmers leave this conference, they are not only looking forward to this year's crop, but they are also looking forward to a bright future for the peanut industry. Reporting from Pine Mountain, I'm Mark Wildman for the Georgia Farm Monitor. 
All right, Mark, great job, sir. Well, keeping with this campaign promise, Georgia U.S. Senator David Perdue continues to be a voice for agriculture in Washington, D.C. In fact, during his recent visit to the ABAC and UGA Tifton campus, the senator told a group of constituents that he fought extremely hard to earn a spot on the Senate Ag Committee and that he takes the job very seriously. Somebody said, well, you got it all under control. And I said, yeah, if I said that, you know I'd be lying because it's a, it's a never-ending battle up there. I didn't go up there to make friends. I got plenty of friends in Georgia. But uh, the other thing, y'all, I, I got to tell you, I am so proud to be from a state where agriculture is, is the largest. It's over 50 percent. Not only is it the largest, it's over 50 percent of our economy in the state of Georgia. And I can tell you this, agriculture is in great shape in Georgia for two reasons. And they're sitting right here. Zippy Duval and Gary Black. I, I see a lot of these people in their jobs around the country, and I don't see anybody that can carry their luggage, seriously. Uh, we are so blessed to have these men leading us. They pray for you every day. They pray for me every day. And let me tell you, that makes a difference, and I feel it, and I know you do too. In the meantime, following the success of the inland port in Cordial, state officials have announced plans for a similar facility, this one to open in 2018 in Chatsworth, Georgia. According to the Georgia Ports Authority, the Appalachian Regional Port will have easy access to I-75 and U.S. 411, as well as direct rail service to Savannah. GPA Executive Director Curtis Fultz says because of its location in an industrial region, the new port will likely handle carpet, flooring, automobiles, and tires. Well, today we want to give you an idea of how the Natural Resources Conservation Service is assisting some producers of fruits and vegetables with a very cool incentive. That's right, Ray. The agency is helping with the construction of a high tunnel hoop houses. Recently, I visited one such structure that measures 30 by 96 and is 12 feet high. Don't call this a greenhouse. It's a hoop house. This particular high tunnel hoop house in Paulding County belongs to Robert Red Spain. Oh, uh, the growing season. All year round, you all year round, and uh, you can uh, less insects you have to put up with, and in your water, is which is a drip system, and you can kind of regulate all your water. And the winter time, when it gets down to about uh, 28 degrees, I built me another hoop house inside, and uh, had tomatoes all year round. The reason I did that is on account I don't have any electrical stuff in here. No fans, no nothing. Just straight out, <laughs> straight out heat. That's what I like. And your hoop house is a, um, uh, see, it's just a good investment. If, you, if you've got the money to build one, I'd say build two or three of them, you know. Shamika Mosley from the NRCS in Carrollton said the interest in hoop houses growing across the country, and there are incentives for producing the fruits and vegetables inside. The high tunnel is through an initiative with through NRCS. Um, it's the High Tunnel Initiative through EQIP. And in order to get um, started with EQIP, you have to do a sign up. So the first thing you would need to do is find your local NRCS office, which Mr. Spain did. Um, and from there, you will start the application process. With that application process, you have to have meet certain eligibility requirements. Uh, those requirements are first, you come in with a social security number or an employee's ID. Um, if you have an employee's ID, um, you will need to get a DUNS number and a CCR registration. Um, benefits of, of a high tunnel, um, first, you extend your growing season. Um, also, as Mr. Spain said, you know, you keep out your insects. Um, you can have uh, fresher and better produce because the insects, you know, are not readily available to the high tunnel. Um, also, you control your water management. You're not as using, you're more efficient with your water. Whether you call it farming or gardening, Spain told us the hoop house doesn't give him more hours in the day, but it does provide more days in a growing season. <laughs> I don't know. There's as many people come and say, Red, there's nobody in the world could build something like you're doing. There's no way. But I've got a lot of people that challenge me, you know, and they say, well, uh, you can't grow corn in it. You can't do this. And I say, well, uh, if, it's, if there's a wheel, there's a way. So that's what I do. Um, I hosted a 
winter program this past winter on fruits and vegetables and had a good turnout. So our area is definitely having a growing uh, group of producers that are interested on the smaller scale of growing fruits and vegetables for the local direct markets. Spain confided there is one secret to the success of the great fruits and vegetables. All your flowers take all your insects away. I call it the Texas rose. I don't know what they are, but they come from Texas. My wife's from Texas. That's where I got flowers from. And for your information, there will be a high tunnel workshop in Carrollton on Wednesday, August 13th. For those interested in getting additional information on the benefits and the NRCS funding program and taking the tour as well, you can contact Paula Burke at this email address, pjburke at uga.edu. Now still to come on the monitor, who let the goats out? You're why every summer there's a common sight at one particular research facility. Speaking of research, from time to time you hear us talking about the UGA Tifton or Athens campus and the many research projects they have going on. Well, coming up after the break, we'll head to the Griffin UGA campus and hear about some exciting things taking place there. Stay tuned. You're watching the Georgia Farm Monitor. I'm Mary Caitlin Wheeler and I am one of the Central Region State Vice Presidents and I am from East Lawrence. I started in FFA because my dad was really involved in agriculture and so I wanted to take after him and I have a passion for agriculture and working with animals and actually getting to know people through FFA and ag. For me, I'm different than most people. I had cancer so I walk with a cane and I felt at first maybe I wouldn't fit in and through FFA, I found my spot and how I can get involved. And I feel like even if you feel different than everybody else, you do have a place and you can get involved with FFA. To learn more about the National FFA Organization, log on to FFA.org. All right, the monitor continues. And would you look at this? Hundreds of goats on the loose. Actually, the goats, they have a purpose. You see, every summer, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in California uses a herd of goats to graze on lawns to reduce the risk of fire. Now, this particular video proved so popular that it's been viewed more than 2 million times on Facebook and YouTube. According to Berkeley Lab, a full-time grass herder monitors the happily feasting goats as they whittle down the grass, making sure they are in the appropriate green areas the herder, along with his dogs, they move 800 goats from one hillside location to the next. Well, just 35 miles south of Atlanta, the UGA Griffin campus has the unique opportunity of being able to address urban ag issues. But you see, all too often, the campus gets overlooked by other research projects going on, say, in Tifton or even the Athens campus. Recently, the monitor traveled to Spalding County and was given a first-hand look at the many exciting things on the horizon. Yes, one could certainly say things are looking up here at UGA Griffin. From the use of unmanned aerial systems to proper irrigation techniques, this sprawling campus has just about every type of research imaginable. Originally, this was an ag experiment station back in the 1800s. And all this used to be worked uh, in row crops and eventually made it into peaches and peppers and things like that. But uh, now this is much more of an urban ag campus. Um, turf grass is one of the anchor, pro anchor programs here on, on the Griffin campus. Uh, same thing with uh, uh, food science and food safety. So um, all these are things that, that affect large population centers and, and Atlanta being just up the road positions us real well to do the research and, and ex outreach and education for uh, those kinds of, um, of, of clientele. Most folks don't realize it, but turf in the state of Georgia is about an $8 billion industry and it employs over 87,000 employees in this state. So, you know, there's a lot that goes into turf in the green industry in the state of Georgia and we're kind of that research and development education arm for that industry. And with close to 25 acres of turf research plots, UGA Griffin continues to make strides in the area of turf management and improvements. However, with that much ground to cover, Waltz and the rest of the staff found themselves needing an extra set of eyes. Welcome to the world of UAS technology, also known as unmanned aerial systems. Right now we're using them more for photo documentation um, is, is where we are. So being able to put out a research trial, whether it's a weed science trial, or whether it's a fertility trial, or whether it's looking at breeding plots, or cultivar evaluation of, of put those plots in, 
get up high, be able to take some nice pictures of them, and, and progress those through the, the life of the study. So if, particularly think of like a fertility study. You know, this would be one way of being able to document changes in green and lengths of green color and retention for slow release fertilizers and things like that. So this would be an easy way of being able to, to photo document what we're seeing on the ground and sometimes a little easier actually to look at it from above than it is right there ground level or, or head high. And in just a few years, Waltz and the rest of the Griffin staff will be able to share that data much easier thanks large in part to a planned $8.5 million facility dedicated entirely to turf grass research and education. For the first time ever we'll have all of our, our turf faculty under one roof and the collaboration should increase. So we've got faculty offices, we've got faculty labs or labs that will be associated with each one of those programs as well as some biotechnology uh, with it. And then uh, we have greenhouse facility and headhouse facilities to support all of that. Uh, we'll have a small classroom to be able to do outreach and education to uh, industry groups and to county agents statewide. So um, we'll have a facility that really will allow our faculty here on the Griffin campus to, to elevate our programs and hopefully collaborate and keep an industry in the state of Georgia that's a very strong, large part of, of the economic driver to the state. And those are just some of the research projects going on at UGA Griffin. Coming up next week on The Monitor, we'll have more from the campus, including the unique ways in which they are trying to grow the ideal peach. And by that, I mean a type of peach geared towards your particular taste buds. Again, that's next week, same time, same channel. Well, before you know it, Farm Bureau members from across the country will converge in Orlando for the American Farm Bureau's annual convention. And as Eric Clements reports today, a list of activities and featured speakers will prove to be a real crowd pleaser. Registration for the 2016 American Farm Bureau annual convention and Idea Ag trade show in Orlando will open in October. The convention takes place January 10th to the 12th with pre-convention events the two days before. AFBF convention specialist John Hawkins says Orlando gives the event a family atmosphere to enjoy. Orlando is an amazing place, not just because of Disney and because of MGM Grand out there, but because of all the agriculture. We have fabulous ag tours this year put on by the Florida Farm Bureau, and there's just a lot to do in the city. The 2016 convention keynote speaker will be Barbara Corcoran of Shark Tank. If anyone's watched Shark Tank, they know her story, how she started out as a D student, probably worked 20 jobs between high school and college, and then took and turned a $1,000 loan into a $5 billion real estate company, which is just simply amazing. So it ties in very well with everything that we're doing with the REI Challenge, and so we figured also it's about time that a woman takes the stage and addresses the Farm Bureau audience. The final round of competition for the Farm Bureau Rural Entrepreneurship Challenge will also take place during the convention. Farm Bureau is also looking for more speakers for presentations during the convention. They can actually find all information about the annual convention at our website, which is annualconvention.fb.org. And on there, they will see a tab for speakers under programs. And they click there, they'll see a request for speakers form, and they'll go through and read all the different options. That website again is annualconvention.fb.org. Michael Clements, Washington. When we come back, it's never too early to learn about farm safety, and that includes those who don't even live near a farm. Stay with us on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Portions of this program brought to you by... The kindergarten is now open for education. Enough with the adult stuff, the dedication ceremony and all. It's time to get our hands dirty, with our parents' permission. This is kindergarten, spelled K-I-N-D-E-R-G-A-R-D-E-N. It's an outdoor classroom and play area for children at UT's Plateau Ag Research and Education Center and the UT Gardens on site. Kids like seven-year-old Grove Stevens say there's lots of cool stuff here. Well, it's that it's very beautiful that we grow like stuff and um, you grow flowers and um. I'm going to ask my mom if I can grow a flower at my house, and, um, and if I can, it's taking care of our community. Children can explore nine unique areas and see and touch many things. Each part of the kindergarten is designed to enhance cognition, physical development, social skills, and literacy. An, an educational and a fun area that kids can come and learn 
uh, about agriculture, to read, to have activities. It's open to the public, and we just think that's going to be a, a tremendous resource for the community. The whole point here is to have children really experience gardening, not just learn about it in a book, but to get the physical sensation of digging in the dirt, planting something, and watching it grow. These are called peak pots. These pots are made out of dirt. Cumberland County Master Gardeners came up with the idea for the kindergarten and will lead programs here for children. That includes helping them try their hand at potting plants. The gardeners say when kids are physically active through gardening, the play and work stimulates the brain. It was developed as sort of an early childhood education garden, not just for gardening, vegetables, that sort of thing, but actually just all of the early childhood education skills, you know, counting and gross motor coordination, a little bit of, of early music education, things like that. Learning as play is a tune we can all enjoy. The kindergarten is now in session, growing plants and young minds. Senses engaged, imaginations freed, beauty as an academic lesson. Future gardeners seem to approve. This is Chuck Denny reporting. All right, Chuck, thanks so much. Now, with all kinds of equipment and animals around the farm, it's important for children to know the importance of safety when visiting a farm. Yeah, that's why every year the Spalding County Farm Bureau invites children around the area to attend their Farm Safety Day. Our Damon Jones was there and has the story. It doesn't matter if they're growing up on the farm or just visiting one. It's important for children to know some basic safety tips to keep them out of harm's way. That's why the second annual Farm Safety Day held on the University of Georgia Griffin campus is so important as it allows kids to learn valuable information they otherwise wouldn't get. I just don't think that they're taught this in schools or anything like that. I feel like it's up to the community to, to bring them out here and just teach them a little bit about safety that, and issues they may face on a daily basis. With most of these kids not around the farm on a daily basis, it's more important than ever to expose them to some of the dangers as they are likely to visit a farm in the near future. Well, you know, the, the thing is that a lot of the kids in our area don't necessarily grow up on farms, but nowadays kids visit farms a lot. And truth be known, you can get into just as much visiting a farm as you can living on one and probably aren't gonna know as much about what can hurt you if you don't live on one as opposed to just going and visiting one. And at this event, all the bases were covered as kids got to hear from experts on electricity, boating safety, and of course, farming. It's that kind of diversity the organizers think will really benefit the children in the long run. You never know what you're going to get into on a farm. Uh, you know, it's just important to cover everything that you can because it might that one that one thing you don't cover might be what somebody gets hurt on with 10 different stations and more than 50 kids in attendance this certainly wasn't a small event and while it might have taken some hard work to put together it really was a labor of love uh, we started planning about three months ago and it just takes time to find the volunteers to come out and teach the classes and of course we have to have volunteers to just help with the kids throughout the day but it, it does, it's a little work, but it's worth it in the end. And it wasn't just fun for the kids, as the volunteers, whether they were presenting or just chaperoning, also had a good time putting on this event. They enjoy it. I mean, we all love working with the kids. And, I mean, this is one of the, after last year, I've decided this is one of my favorite events that we do. We really have a good time putting it together. As for what the organizers hope the kids will take away from today, just be aware of their surroundings when they're on their small farm, large farm, or even out visiting a farm. Uh, is something as small as being around a, a horse or a cow. You know, don't don't walk around the back of it. It's it's a dangerous. It can be a dangerous animal. Reporting from Griffin, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. All right, Damon, great job, sir. That is going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Now, just a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and the Farm Monitor Show. We leave you today with another look at the goat stampede from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in California. Not oh. a bad video. Oh, have a uh, great week, everybody.